All right, everybody. Um, we want to welcome you uh, on behalf of the Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution um, to this uh, online discussion uh, of uh, the war in Gaza uh, entitled, How Did We Get Into This War and um, How Do We Get Out of It? What are the prospects for peace? Um, and uh, we have a lot of people uh, participating today. We're very happy to, to, to have you here. Delighted to have so many people here. And um, uh, we will keep our, all our remarks as, as brief as possible and leave time for a good discussion uh, when we're finished. But first I would like to uh, uh, introduce our Dean, uh, Al Bozerdem. Uh, who has a few uh, words of welcome to give. Al, thanks for being here and go right ahead. Thank you, Rich, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Dean of the Carter School, uh, let me start by welcoming you all uh, to this important event. And I wanna thank Emeritus Professor Rich Rubenstein for his leadership in organizing it and the members of the Carter School community uh, who will share their personal reflections. We have our faculty, students, and alumni represented in this panel. Uh, I must say this is a true uh, teamwork. And um, as the Carter School, we want to closely engage uh, with the Mason community on contemporary peace and conflict resolution uh, matters. Uh, therefore, we will hold several events for our Mason community to gain a deeper understanding of the Israel-Palestine conflict and engage with each other constructively. And I'm particularly pleased that over 250 people registered to this event. So it seems that um, we are succeeding with our objective, objective and we are making a great start uh, to our series. So um, following today's uh, event, there will be another one at 11 a.m. tomorrow, focusing on women and children as targets of war. And finally, we will hold uh, the Gaza narrative between clin uh, clinical analysis and moral judgment event on December the 7th. So once again, Thanks very much for participating in this event. And um, please visit our website for further information on forthcoming events and other uh, public engagement opportunities. Rich, over to you. All right, thank you very much, Al. Um, well, uh, dear friends, uh, uh, we're here um, to talk about um, a terrible conflict um, and one which has, um, in one way or another, got us all disturbed, uh, both as uh, peacemakers and uh, as human beings. And um, so I have just a very few remarks um, about the conflict, and then I'll in introduce, um, starting to introduce our speakers. Um, um, uh, what is there about this conflict that makes it so difficult? Um, um, most difficult of all for the people directly involved, of course, but also difficult for us far away. Um, one factor surely is that it's so terribly violent. Um, as you know, uh, about 1200 Jews and others were killed in the Hamas attack on October 7th the largest number of Jews killed in, in such a lot in altogether since the Holocaust uh, and a traumatic event um, for uh, many people uh, both in, in Israel and Palestine and around the world. Uh, since then more than 13,000 Palestinian residents of Gaza have been killed, um, which is about um, six-tenths of a percent of the whole population of Gaza. 
which if you want to do the equivalency is equivalent to 2 million Americans uh, being killed, enormous suffering, um, people um, dying, being injured, losing friends, losing family, uh, worrying about hostages, worrying about tomorrow. Uh, and so uh, the suffering uh, spills very far over and it, it starts to include us all. Of course, this is not just a matter of deaths, uh, the number of deaths or the number of injuries. Um, we know in the Congo between three and seven million people have died. Um, in that war, we know that uh, according to the Watson Institute at Brown, at least 940,000 people have been killed in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, and Pakistan since 9-11. Uh, since uh, and civilian deaths just in the wars on terror that the United States has conducted and, or participated in since 9-11, 432,000 civilians have been, have been killed in those wars. So we're not just talking about uh, large numbers of people being killed, as, as horrific as that is. But we're also talking about the fact that in a conflict like this, we are implicated much more directly. We in the United States, in Europe and elsewhere around the world are implicated directly because of the area, to begin with, an area of intense religious, cultural, geopolitical, economic interest. Uh, to Americans, uh, Europeans, Jews, Christians, Muslims, and, and the U.S. government, of course. The United States government is a party to this conflict. It's, it's Israel's principal supporter and financier, and now reportedly attempting to pressure the Netanyahu regime to lower the number of civilian casualties. Uh, a situation which, as you probably know, is impacting the forthcoming United States election, uh, and so which has involved people who feel very intensely about the controversy on one side or the other. Uh, controversies produced by this war have split groups who formerly worked together for peace in the Middle East, including uh, groups like... Uh, our profession, uh, peace and conflict resolution profession. Um, well, for those of you who are following this sort of thing, um, our friends uh, Guy and Heidi Burgess at the, uh, their journal Beyond Intractability uh, published uh, a piece on uh, uh, the conflict, which I, I strongly disagreed with and published a piece of my own in Counterpunch magazine, and that debate has been continuing. But that's just a small piece of what is a very large and increasingly um, intense and difficult debate involving uh, all sorts of groups who consider themselves peacemakers or peace builders. So be in part because of that, we wanted to have this conversation to help others and help ourselves think more clearly and feel more universally about this struggle and the possible outcomes. We're, this is the beginning of a conversation, it's not the end of one. As Alp said, there are further events taking place here. There'll be further events taking place, I know, in your lives. Uh, we don't have a peace plan to present, a detailed peace plan, but we'd like to be able to point towards the possibilities of peace. Um, we'd like, I think, most of all, to help make it possible for us to talk about this difficult situation um, without uh, disowning each other. Uh, in my own family, um, one of my close relatives posted something on uh, Facebook, which another of my close relatives read and wrote him saying that he was no, as far as he was concerned, he was no longer a member of the family. Right? And that's how intense people feel, intensely people feel about it. And I know that you know that 
uh, as well. So I'm not going to emphasize it. I'm only going to emphasize that this is a place in which I think people should be free to express themselves uh, about these hard questions, uh, but a place in which we, I think we're going to try, know we're going to try to help each other talk about this in a way that's constructive and that doesn't destroy relationships, uh, that helps to build relationships. So with that introduction, uh, let me introduce our first uh, speaker uh, today, um, who uh, is, uh, and uh, all of the speakers are members uh, of the East, uh, of the Carter School community in one sense or another. Uh, our first speaker, Professor Muhammad Abu Nimer, um, was a student, uh, a doctoral student at the Carter School. Um, he is at present uh, the first occupant of the Abdul Aziz Saeed Chair in International Peace and Conflict Resolution at American University, where he's a full professor. Uh, Mohammed's the founder of the Salam Institute for Peace and Justice. He's the founder and co-editor of the Journal of Peace Building and Development. Uh, he was the director of the Conflict Resolution Skills Institute at American University, and he's certainly one of our most distinguished uh, alumni and has been consistently a force for peace in the Middle East and elsewhere. Uh, Mohammed, we're so glad to have you here. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, now I can. There you go. I said thank you, Rich, for the warm introduction. And I am. Uh, I also said good afternoon and salam alaikum. I am uh, delighted to be here. It's a, it's a, I'm looking forward for such a space to share and reflect on the three questions that um, uh, Rich really put. One is, you know, how did we get here? How can we, we have conversations and sustain relationships in the context of uh, peacemakers and uh, people who are sharing similar values. At least that's what I thought uh, for about 35 years. The, but this uh, this conflict has brought many things to questioning in my mind, and I'll share that later. Um, I'm definitely one of those people who are having a crisis in, in many ways, including the relationship that I have built in the so-called field conflict resolution and peace building. Um, and also, you know, how we can go forward. I think Rich was your third question. Right. You know, I, I speak from a peace and conflict resolution perspective, obviously, it's something that I, uh, you know, denounce violence in the name of any identities, gender, sexual orientation, nationalism, religion, or uh, any other form of identity to justify violence. I think we should have all forms of violence as taboo, uh, militarization, weaponization. Uh, we should reject all of these forms of violence by all people, not only by one group, and also reject it in a way, a serious way, exactly like we reject violence in our own families, in our own nuclear families, I should say, it, and we try to treat it as a taboo. That's my starting point, and this is what I work for for four decades of my life toward that objective, and hopefully will continue to do so. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict, some basic views from my own assumption I'm making, is not about religion, it's about self-determination. It's always been about land. It's always been about the Palestinian national movement, uh, gaining uh, territorial sovereignty over a full historic Palestine or part of historic Palestine. Uh, the 23% uh, uh, in the West Bank and Gaza. And since 1948, the Israeli government, you know, with the support of the allies of the American and European government, have did everything possible, I think, to prevent the creation of the Palestinian state or on any part of historic Palestine for various reasons and various justification. The Israeli occupation of 1967 it has a system and has a feature. All of its feature uh, point to the system of apartheid and colonization of land. All the practices are there, yet we were hesitant to name it and label it this way for many, for many decades. 
Um, since 1967, Jewish settlement in the territory have increased on those 23% in order to create facts on the ground. And in many ways, they succeeded in creating these facts on the land that even two-state solution became, it became in, a, in a question. For the past 75 years, Palestinian liberation movement, regardless of their ideology, has always been labeled as terrorist. Regardless, Hamas, Fatih, PFLP, DFLP, uh, non-violence, myself, Mubarak, all many people who work on that were labeled terrorists by many other groups. And since last year, Israeli government, historically speaking, uh, led by a uh, control, led by ultra religious right wing leadership, Ben Gvir and Smutrich, who believe that they should uh, speed the ending of the conflict. This ideology of to speed and settle, finish the conflict, have motivated many, uh, many, many harsh policies in the West Bank and also on Gaza, including assassination and many other uh, acts in order to escalate the, the, the conflict mainly to reach a point of explosion, which I think October 7 attack provided a, a perfect pretext for that government in order to execute the transfer the transfer plan and the depopulation, uh, the depopulation of the Palestinian in there. The ideology of the Israeli government since 1996 when Netanyahu came in is to destroy Oslo and the Palestinian have no right to the land. There will be no Palestinian state and the, the, uh, uh, there will be no equal rights for non-Jews in Israel. Statement by Netanyahu several times this year. That's the ideology we're dealing with and Oslo obviously is, is failed and dead and has collapsed. And what we, where we find ourselves today after the Gaza war and after the attack of October 7, we find ourselves back in square one, 1950s, struggling to gain back to the recognition of the two people with each other. And I think we arrived here mainly because of four principles that I want to mention them, four principles in which in, in which in which this horrible attack on Ga uh, of Gaza uh, uh, October 7 uh, you know take took place and and provide this this context for the Israeli uh, attack on Gaza and those four principles has to do to deal with that the Palestinians are not human we find ourselves struggling for our humanity since 1948 and even before, Palestinians are not equally human. Palestinians are again fighting for that humanity. And this war has illustrated that very, uh, very, very clearly in the discourse that emerged from Israel as well as from the United States government and European government in support of the dehumanization of Palestinian life. The second, the depersonalization of Palestinian victims. Palestinian victims are always not, they, they, they don't have names, they don't have stories, they don't have life be, beside them. Debating the number of victims of Palestinian, while the president of the US described Abigail, the, the two years old for in, in a half of his speech, rather than lifting one name of Palestinian victims in the past six weeks or so out of th tens of thousands of Palestinian. Women, Palestinian children who are released from from the prison are not allowed to celebrate. They have to sign documents in order to uh, assure that they are not to express any human, uh, um, you know, any sense of a humanity being released from the prison. While the Israeli prisoners, the Israeli hostage can celebrate and have their own privacy uh, as well. And that the way it has been, 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 uh, uh, been covered. The deprivation and the humiliation of, uh, deprive human dignity for the Palestinian for the past 75 years in every single security arrangement that Israel has done in, the, in that part. All of this reduced the aspect of Palestinian, being Palestinian to being non-human, constantly humiliated in checkpoints and receiving the tax from Israel in every other aspects. The second point that led us to this is the ideology of moral superiority. This notion that the Zionist ideology that came to Palestine in, in 18, 1880 uh, is, is, is supported by Jewish moral superiority in comparison to Palestinian indigenous 
who live in the land. It is after all land without people to people without land. This ideology have brought such legitimacy to the use of violence, which is my third point. It has to do with the superiority of military power uh, is an effective form of deterrence. Israel military power has always been the principle in which they dealt with Palestinian in the West Bank, in Gaza, as well as inside, inside Israel. The more powerful the Israeli military is, supposedly the more secure, but at the end, it's always the opposite. The more secure, the, the more powerful the Israeli army, it turned out the less secure the Israeli and the less secure uh, uh, the Palestinian. Finally, the fourth point that we have a weaponization uh, and historic victimhood in which anti-Semitism and the fight against is used in the fight against Palestinian. As, as Finkelstein, Chomsky, Elam Pepe, many other Jewish Israeli and Jewish scholar pointed to the weaponization of the Holocaust. And that's why October 7 immediately triggered that aspect and, it, and, and provide such a public legitimacy for the full attack on the Palestinian. That weaponization of the victimhood provide this sense of exceptionalism and lack of accountability that Israel army, Israel government is not held accountable for any international law. On the Palestinian side, so you don't think it is one-sided analysis. The Palestinian in their response to these four principles of policy in dealing with them have developed exactly the same. They said Israeli military and forces are inhumane in their practice in that it justify all forms of Palestinian resistance. Palestinian also said Israeli occupation is immoral and inhumane, therefore we cannot, the Palestinian, we cannot coexist with it. Despite the super military power of Israeli, they are afraid from their shadows. Therefore, they need to be confronted by all means. That's how Palestinians develop their narrative. And Israel culture is built on immorality and have no ethics. Therefore, no need to seek commonalities with the Israeli. Israeli policymaker and society only understand the language of violence as Osama Hamdan said yesterday, three times, he's from Hamas, three times. So Palestinians don't understand except the language of violence or the same thing for the Israeli, the Palestinian repeatedly. These are typical responses of Palestinians in, 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 to, the, to the four foundation of policy that Israel has used to uh, have, have been using uh, to, deal, to deal with them. In the, past, in the past 56 years at least, we have not learned the lessons that those four principles need to be changed. I have led hundreds of Israeli-Palestinian dialogue group. And every time we come to the point at the end of the first day, middle of the second day, that says, can you recognize us as a human? Can you recognize us as equal? Can we have the same equal rights to the land? Can we have the same equal dignity, uh, right for dignity and the freedom? At the end of the day, the two groups are feeding into each other, into this cycle of violence. The difference, one is an occupied, occupied and the other one is an occupier. And one can go home and sleep, at least up after, before say, October 7, sleep in some sort of a privileged reality to travel and leave while the other is under, under occupation. That reality obviously cannot continue. And you know the, the October 7 attack definitely left, left so much victimhood within the Israeli side that you have 120,000 displaced. You have 1,200 were killed. Many soldiers also were killed as well. Uh, there is serious a crisis of victimhood within the Israeli uh, uh, society as well, and I see it. I want to finish here by saying that the way to get out of this, although we are back into square one, whether we recognize them or they recognize us, and that's the discourse right now between Israel and Palestine. Palestinians speak about Nakba, and Israelis speak about the Holocaust, and we back into the same cycle of competing who's the victimhood and debating the numbers. I think we have to go back, one, to humanizing each other, as Palestinian and Israelis as well, and look on continuous basis 
how to rebuild that sense of humanity and to revise the Israeli education, media, social socialization agency that all now legitimate uh, have the legitimacy to dehumanize Palestinian, the same for the Palestinian side. Also to insist on the preserving a human dignity in each interaction between Israel and Palestinian. And as an outsider in this group and others, I think when we do diagnosis and analysis of the conflict, we have to insist on this human equality between the two sides uh, as well, and not to give exceptions to one or the other. We need, we need to speak up against the injection of more weapon into the system of Israeli-Palestinian conflict, they do not need more arms, more sophisticated arm. Even nuclear weapon cannot cannot solve this problem. Even if we remove the entire the entire the entire Gaza Strip, other Palestinian within ten years will emerge to do the same acts of 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 confronting Israeli occupation. We need one more point. We need to name injustice in our responsibility as peacemaker, as we stand and ally to each other, ally to each other, being silent or debating whether this is an act of complacency does not help. We need to speak against anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and anti-Palestinian phobia as well. The best way that anyone can support Israeli-Palestinian conflict forward is really to speak and insist on peace, justice, on the basis of equal dignity and the freedom for all people from the river to the sea, and not only for one side. I'll stop here. I'm happy to engage later. Thank you, Rich. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Um, thanks, indeed. Uh, for our next uh, speakers, I think I'll introduce them, the two of them. They may do some uh, dialoguing between them. Um, and so we have two uh, alumni of our school. Uh, first, I wanna introduce Dr. Adina Friedman, a Carter School alumna, uh, one of our uh, professors, a conflict resolution practitioner. Uh, Dr. Friedman grew up in Israel and has worked and traveled extensively through the Middle East, has done uh, many uh, dialogue groups has studied violence and terrorism, has worked with refugees and internally displaced uh, people, uh, has worked run, uh, run workshops uh, all over the region in the MENA region, and has been very active in, uh, in the District of Columbia in organizing study groups uh, in several universities um, of, of the Middle East. So Adina, we're very happy that you're here and also very happy that Fakhra is here too. I'm going to introduce her at the same time, and now I'll leave it to them to decide how they want to handle their 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 time as speakers. Dr. Fakhra Haloun is another of our alumni. Uh, she is a senior specialist on conflict resolution and peace building at the Salam Institute uh, for Peace and Justice. She is a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Um, who after completing her PhD with us, worked for two years in the UN as special coordinator in the office of the special coordinator for Middle East, Middle East Peace in Jerusalem uh, at UNSCO, UNSCO it's called. Uh, while there she designed uh, UN strategies on engaging with Israeli and Palestinian civil society organizations to enhance their impact on political process and to end the Israeli occupation and promote a peaceful solution to the conflict. She's been involved in the peace building field for 20 years and has worked in for many years in facilitating dialogue between Palestinians and Israelis in a variety of settings. Uh, so uh, Adina and Fakhra, I'll turn it over to you. Adina, do you wanna start? Sure. Okay. Hi everyone. So. Um, although what we will each speak for our time, but um, a lot of what we say is a result also of our, or is a follow up on our conversations that we've had before and in the last few days as well. So first of all, I uh, agree with pretty much all that, with all I would say, of what Muhammad said, maybe with slightly different emphases, and I'll focus on a few different, maybe I'll focus a little differently on a few of the points. So first of all, as 
as was said, our communities, Israeli and Palestinian and all their variations and Jewish American and Arab American, et cetera, and the peace community um, have undergone and are undergoing extreme trauma. Um, trauma that, so trauma that uh, doesn't necessarily lead to us being more empathetic to the other. Sometimes it's maybe the contrary. Um, and is I would say for Israeli Jews, not only for Israelis in general, but Jews in particular in Israel, this uh, violence by Hamas, that trauma is compounded by the fact that it took the military so many hours to get there for whatever reasons we haven't yet fully uncovered. But so I think the notion or the feeling of helplessness that Israelis have felt is what makes this trauma even worse than previously. And the fact that objectively speaking, um, you know, the numbers of Israelis killed are, are lower than the numbers of Palestinians killed, et cetera. As we know from conflict analysis, that doesn't necessarily make a difference. If we talk of relative deprivation, Israelis don't compare themselves to Palestinians. So that's not what they're looking at. And for them, Again, I'm not justifying, I'm just explaining more of the Jewish-Israeli perspective on this. Um, so the um, the fact that there are fewer Jews killed than, than Palestinians overall doesn't change the fact that it's extremely traumatic, doesn't make the Jews necessarily more empathetic. Whoever wasn't empathetic before isn't empathetic now. Whoever was, most of them or many of them still are. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. I would say I, I've heard, I've read a lot of people, a, a lot, a number of Israeli Jews, right, talking about sobering up, like this has been a sobering experience for them. But the sobering is all in one direction. So nobody, so the sobering is like, uh, well, we thought we could talk with Hamas, or we, talk, we thought we could talk with Palestinians, and we see we can't. We thought that the occupation was the problem, but we see they call us, all of us uh, settlers. So so they want us all out of here. That's the direction of the sobering as a, and I haven't yet heard somebody say, well, I sobered up because I realized that we can't, that we as Israelis can't make peace with all other Arabs and think that everything is okay while we ignore the Palestinian issue and just be nice, nice to Saudis or Emiratis or Moroccans, et cetera. I haven't heard sobering, um, maybe there is, but I haven't heard it, saying um, we realize that we can't go on ignoring so many of the realities under which Palestinians live at the hands largely of Israel, and therefore, um, you know, which helped bring about this, this uh, these events since the 7th, which of course didn't start on the 7th. Um, so I ver I hear very little of that sobering. And what I think is happening is that those who were committed, extremely committed before September, or October 7th, stayed there. And those who were kind of center left, a lot, some of them, even though some of them, I would say there was some progress, quote unquote, during the months of demonstrations against the Israeli government, there were some uh progress in the sense that more Israelis in that mainstream left started to connect the dots between what Israel does to Palestinians in the West Bank um, and what happens inside Israel and everything's related. A lot of those people went back to where they were before. So there's very little, I haven't heard anybody who said, wow, after September 7th, after October 7th, I realized we really need peace, who didn't think so before. So, um, and I think the people here, as far as I know, um, were there before and are there now. I mean, we stayed in that sense. I mean, there's still the solution crisis, all the things that Muhammad mentioned. I think we are each going through unbelievable trauma as well, even though we're not living there. Well, Fakhar is, but the rest of us are here, but it it's still so complex and so traumatizing in many directions, not just that we know people killed sometimes and usually on both sides, at least those of us here. Um, but we know, but we also can't say anything because anything we say is construed or misconstrued 
by our own, quote unquote, as um, not and not anything by everyone, but traders um, in Israel, there's a price to be paid for every one of us. I think there's a price to be paid for seeing complexity. And in Israel, there's also, um, although th things have been consistent with a lot of, with all governments over the years, this government exceeds all the others. And it's, I don't even have the words to describe, but um, so it's illegal. If you say, if you give a name and a face to a Palestinians killed in Gaza, you're labeled a terrorist or a terrorist supporter. You you could be fired, put in jail if you're Jewish. If you're Arab, then we're not even talking. Then you're really uh, in worse trouble in Israel if you're a Palestinian citizen of Israel. So either way, there's that kind of um, uh, consequence, and there's also just friends either disowning you or just or just uh, being very unhappy with you for the time being hopefully that'll change but anyway um i think our commitment to complexity and to certain kinds of values should remain should remain is very critical because i've heard in the past um from our school years ago although but people who have PhDs or almost, had almost PhDs in the, this field, but when it applied to their own conflict, they forgot everything they learned. Oh, that there's just, they're good guys and bad guys. Um, we're very sensitive about this thing as opposed to the other. And it's like, if we, if we, as people here and everybody listening, if we can't apply what we learn to ourselves, to the conflicts that we're part of, what's the freaking point of what we learned? What's the point? Because we ask other people with whom we work to deal with conflicts that are their conflicts. How can we ask them to do that? But then when it comes to us, we'll say, oh, it's too sensitive. I can't deal with it. I can't see straight. I can't say I have to go back to my you know, circle in my wagons. So that commitment uh, to complexity and to the values. So it's not about I'm always pro-Israel. I'm always pro-Palestine. Like Mohammed said, I'm I'm against violence. I'm pro uh, or I'm against um, killing of innocent civilians. It doesn't matter by whom and it doesn't matter who the civilians are. I'm against the ne the negative uh, aspects of nationalism. It could be Zionism's negative aspects and it could be Palestinian nationalism's negative aspects. And it could be Ukrainian negative and nationalism's negative aspects. Um, and the same if we're committed to um, uh, self-determination, it's everybody's self-determination, everybody's dignity, everyone, like Muhammad said. So I'm reiterating that, those points. I think the, it's important to remember again in our field, we talk about symmetry and asymmetry. So conflicts like this one are asymmetrical in the, in the structures and the political power, et cetera, but they're symmetrical in that they have human beings on all sides. It doesn't matter if your your loved one is one of one or one of 10,000 killed, it's the same result. So to remember where symmetry applies and where asymmetry applies and certain analyses one and, but on the human level, it's all, it's the same. And we forget that. And like, I couldn't agree more with Muhammad and I think Fakhari and I discussed this, the, the loss of, and that's my nine minutes. Um, the loss of the dehumanization has reached new depths that are unbelievable. I mean, there always was a level of it, but what I what we see now going on is unbelievable, uh, so bad, and um, yeah, and that we need to start working on those things. One of the hopeful things I saw just yesterday on Facebook by Hagar, which is a Jewish Arab um, school in Israel in the Negev, is the kids, so Jews and Arabs learn there, it's bilingual, binational. Um, they have a, um, they call a compassion corner for the kids that they can each, they each write, letters or or draw pictures for whoever they want to whatever party they are doesn't matter and that's something that has to that has to happen from age zero and it doesn't happen 
in any in either of those societies and it doesn't happen in the US either. So that's something so basic that the notion of the humanizing is it's not a cliche. It's one of the biggest jumps in conflict analysis or in conflict resolution that people can take. And it's sometimes taken as it's not a cognitive process. It's an it's an emotional kind of process that it, you know, if we go back to to the idea of uh, you know imagined communities, enough imagining communities because that always means that there's someone other outside of our community, and that should not be, that's not conducive to the peace building that we want to engender. Um, another point I wanted to make, uh, so Muhammad also said, and maybe Fakhar has had this experience, dialogues. So many dialogues, I would, wouldn't label 80% of the dialogues that take place with that name dialogues, because if they don't have the component of deep, deep um, self-reflection, it's not dialogue. Dialogue by default, by definition, has to have that. If it doesn't, if it has taboos, if you don't unturn every uncomfortable issue, it's not dialogue as it should be. And then let's not be surprised that we don't get the results you know, we don't move forward like we should, and, and it's reversible. One last point, maybe. No, two last points. One is anti-Semitism. So anyway, anti-Semitism, just to say that it's real. I mean, it's exacerbated. It's uh, manipulated sometimes, but it's also real, very real, and very real in the U.S. Uh, and the last point, just that um, I think part of the reason that a lot of people are sobering in one direction rather than the other is that we don't confront history and we don't confront difficult path, pasts. And that's true for everybody, whoever we are. And so if we are surprised that 1948 isn't over as Jews, it's because we didn't listen, we didn't pay attention, and we shouldn't be surprised. And, and it doesn't mean that Palestinians you know, don't have to reckon with the past as well. It just means that if both of us don't reckon with the past, we'll find ourselves in the same place again and again. So yeah, that's my last pen. Thank you. Adina, thank you. you. As usual, you talk common sense and from the heart. Uh, Fakhra, we're very interested to hear what you have to say now. Would you please? Uh, th over? Thank, thank you so much, uh, Rich, for the opportunity. And thank you, uh, Carter. Um, to be honest, um, like I may take uh, you to a different level and to reflect through my personal story, which I think it's maybe will shed the light uh, and uh, help us to make reorder in the values and uh, the lens, how we look to this uh, uh, horror and uh, massive suffering of civilians that uh, takes us uh, to uh, reflect on a lot of questions. I have to say that it's not an easy, uh, it's a challenge for me to uh, be to talk today, uh, and like I have a fog of emotions with the like uh, high intensity. Also, because of the dark tunnel that we all uh, are there, Palestinians and Israelis today, today. But also because of my identity as Palestinian and also citizen of Israel, that uh, currently I live in Israel, and also at the same time I'm engaged with peace building with peace builders in Palestine and in Israel. So it's all this complexity uh, during this pain and uh, like a uh, high uh, suffer of civilians, a uh, high level of uh, rage and high level of revenge. And uh, while each side dehumanized the, the other side. Um, I want to say that uh, uh, like when when October 7th happened definitely I was in Israel and it was like uh, it wasn't it's uh, like as everybody it's a lot of atrocities a lot of scenes of suffer uh, the loss of people and the 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 high uh, the high rage and pain but also the way that Israel, uh, the the way that Palestine, the way that Israelis took took this uh, October seven uh, to to a collective trauma with the uh, overwhelming support to any massive attack to Palestinians. And I do agree with the, the context that uh, Dr. Muhammad gave. So the seventh of October definitely 
it was very hard uh, situation, but also uh, the way that Israel wanted to isolate it from uh, the conflict and to isolate it from the context and to see, to see it as, uh, the, as the beginning, you say, you know, and like it's a high level of uh, revenge around me. At the same time, the scenes in Gaza and the genocide and the killing of people that we are all disturbed by the hard scene of the massive killing and ethnic cleansing is definitely like breaking the heart in a lot of levels that, uh, that it's a, a very high level and destruction that uh, every, and the silence of the people. But I want to say that I am as Palestinian who live in Israel, as Sadina said, I cannot, I am not allowed as Palestinian to speak the, the other narrative. I'm just allowed to speak the, the narrative that accepted uh, in the, the collective narrative that it's in Israel. And my narrative of any empathy with the suffering of my people, it will be labeled as, a, a, as supporting the enemies. So for me, I will say that during the last few, year, few weeks, I am suffoc suffocated and also fearing the price that I will pay from any mistake that I will do in articulating the events of 7th of October or from any empathy that I may show to Palestinians. But I want to say that I am, I am like in fear and anxiety and, and fearing the price that we, are, we will pay. But I'm also fearing the price that I may pay in the future because of the level of evil and the level of, uh, of massive uh, attack and killing of people also in Gaza and also here, but also in Gaza and the support of the Israelis, the, the collective Israelis for that, it's also scary for me because the next level of this massive attack may be expelling me from my land as well. So what is the price that I may pay in the future? But I want to say that with all this fear, I cannot sit side and not to do anything. As you said, we came to, uh, to Carter and we studied in order because we have commitment to make a difference between Palestinians and Israelis. But I feel I am have obligation, not just commitment, because if I will not be engaged in solving this conflict or trying to connect also with other Jewish Israelis that believe that the, the 7th of October cannot be just isolated from the context, and do not agree with the, with the massacres happening in Gaza. If I am not engaged with these people, uh, I will probably support uh, another circle of violence that I will pay the price. So I don't have the privilege to sit side also as Palestinian. I want to say that the, in the beginning of the first week, uh, the first week, the first thing that I felt that I, I wanted to do is to connect with my Jewish colleagues that we have been working together to end the occupation, that we built together values of human voices. I felt that uh, uh, with all the dehumanization, the destruction, the evil, the evil that uh, the darkness in the space, I felt that I needed a identity that it is transcending the national identity because the national identity now is allowing the evil to happen in the name of the self-defense or in the name of resistance to colonial uh, apartheid regime. I felt that I needed identity that, uh, that embrace a different values, a moral values. And I think uh, I was sending my Jewish friends, which are sm small, I, I am not I am not saying that they, it's big community, but I was sending them a message saying, I hope your family is good and safe. But to be honest, my hidden message was, I hope you didn't change. Because I was fearing that my colleagues, that we have been working together for a lot of years and building uh, and, 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 and struggling against the occupation, will be moving side because if they will be moving side it means they will support my explode that i will be expelled or i will be killed in the next round of circle of violence so i was scared because i have to connect 
to connect home. I felt that I need to connect home because the surrounding is not home, is not the values. And I have, and I needed people to challenge the, the to challenge the, 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 the discourse about October 7th uh, inside Israel that want to isolate it from the uh, colonial, colonial regime, want to isolate it from the 16 years of siege, from the loss of hope that Palestinians have, from the brutality of the settlements that are increasing. Like if we isolated this uh, event of 7th of October in the narrative of the Israelis from the context, it means uh, there is a risky, another higher level of violence in the uh, coming. I want also to say that whenever I got a message back from the Israeli colleagues, I was celebrating um, the moral impasse of being a peacemaker. I wanted to say that whenever there is like, some of them did change and did support the attack in Gaza and it will be hard for me to work with them now. But I want to say that when it, when it is, as Sadina said, there is real peacemakers, there is a moral compass that, that will not be shaken also in time of very vicious crisis. And for me, when I discover that there is for peacemaker in the world and also in Palestinian Israeli, uh, in, in the Palestinian Israeli conflict, there is a moral compass for peacemakers, but not for all of them. It's for the real peacemakers that are struggling to end the Israeli occupation, see the violence uh, context of the occupier, and also challenge the, the, the forms of resistance, that the armed resistance. I need these voices in order to challenge both sides. Now, a, a, I want also to talk about another debate, another things that inside me that I'm just reflecting in the insights that it's that I have been carrying. I was like being in Israel and just supporting the genocide in in Gaza and the restriction and going to uh, Palestine or going to Jordan and also see the the people there speaking about. Gaza, the war in Gaza and the suffering of the Palestinian and somehow do not touch upon the October 7. So this is, there is also a debate in the world of justification and also trying to isolate the events from the context. And I think this debate of justification which pluralized the, the world, you know, it needed, uh, we need also as peacemaker, Israeli and Palestinian to say something about these events in a way that will help to reorder the moral values in the world. Because it's a question, where is the boundaries of engaging civilians in violence conflict on the name of self-defense as Israel is doing or in the name of a, a um, resistant to colonial apartheid regime. So there is a question, and I think falling into that debate of justification, uh, it's very risky for the world because this, this conflict really, uh, like it's, it's, um, it's uh, designing the discourse in the world about the limits of the evil that we can stretch, how much we can stretch the limits of the evil and also include uh, and include uh, civilian suffering. How much we can have evil in the name of the self-defense or in the name of the resistance or other other things. Uh, okay, so I just want to say that we need to look into this event and to stop there and to see the atrocities in the 7th of October. And we need also to look to the massacres and the genocides in Gaza and to and to grieve the pain and the, lo and the loss and to feel the, the collective trauma. But at the same time, we, we should not isolate this event from the context because as peacemakers, we have to link these events to the root causes also of the, uh, of the occupation and the loss of hope and the colonial regime in order not 
to repeat another circle because otherwise we are we are legitimize another circle of evil and uh, violence. I will end here because I have other things to say about the dehumanization and the moral imagination that we need now for Israelis and Palestinians to imagine that both sides have to live in the same homeland. Otherwise, it we are not going out of this circle. And I will be happy to talk about it and to reclaim the peace building field again in different approaches. I will be happy to talk about that later as well. Thank you very much, Bachara. Thank you. Uh, we are, I'm, I'm happy to tell the speakers, the two remaining speakers to please keep it as short as you can because we didn't, we didn't invite all these people here just to listen to us. We wanna give them a chance to to, to uh, express themselves too, okay? Uh, so I'm very happy now to introduce uh, one of our students. Uh, Moyen Oda is a doctoral candidate uh, with us. Moyen is a very well-known international human rights lawyer, uh, as well as a research and teaching assistant and a PhD student with us. Uh, he represented hundreds of U.S. State Department uh, young represented rep has represented lots of people uh, and represented them in uh, human rights uh, litigation. Uh, he's worked as a U.S. State Department young leader participant in the in a, in, a, in a prestigious State Department program. Um, his resume is uh, long, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but he's an experienced lawyer, and she's won uh, great respect at our school among students and faculty alike, and we're delighted to have him here. Uh, Moyan, uh, take it away. Thank you, Rich. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I'll start by answering the first, maybe a question or a comment you uh, put on side. Is it really a, is it a israeli palestinian conflict is a special conflict? Why it's special? Why it's different than other conflicts? Well, personally, I think it's many, inter, the international community, the Arab countries, the, Jew, the, the Israeli governments, the Palestinian leaderships, they want it to be special. They never want to end it so somehow, so far. I believe there was always an interest and there's, unfortunately, there's still an interest to keep this conflict going on. I don't think it's more bloody than other conflicts around the world. There's many other bloodier conflicts around, maybe not as long as ours, unfortunately, but it's, it's happening all over the world. But I was always saying that our Conflict is, uh, uh, we as Palestinians are, are lucky because our enemies or our occupier are the Israelis. And this, by this, we are getting a lot of attention through the world. Without this, I believe it, if it was happening in, in Africa or South America or other places, I don't believe that the world will be really watching this conflict as much as, as it is. But we're here and, and unfortunately we are having this uh, on, 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 on daily basis now. Uh, I will take the conversation to a different level. Maybe some of my colleagues will not really be happy with it, but <laughs> it's like this. I will speak about the conflict that, of the business in the conflict how, and how this conflict became a business for many people, unfortunately. As, 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 there was the, like I can talk to you about the peace business, and I'm not here attacking anybody. And Bill, I respect everybody. I think they are doing very well job in this. But I will talk about the people to people initiatives that happened through years and years in in in, in this conflict, and hundreds uh, and maybe billions of dollars, not only hundreds of millions of dollars, were spent here. And the result is, I think you don't need to be an expert to know what is the result so far. Uh, I will 
thought, take you through different like perspectives. I, I, I used to manage a five million dollars uh, a human rights uh, and peace building uh, 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 project through one of the uh, uh, diplomatic missions I worked for for five years. Uh, I am a board member of a couple of uh, peace NGOs that are dealing with, with the people to people uh, 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 talks. And I was a, a member of three, maybe four uh, uh, groups like this, Israelis and Palestinians, mainly lawyers to talk about this. But I will start by telling you a story. We have, uh, I'm a member of a, a, a group uh, uh, called Young Legal Leaders uh, that was by the International Bar Association. And we had prominent Israelis and Palestinian lawyers uh, that met through years to try to have a, 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 a legal solution for the, for, the, for the conflict. In one of these meetings in Prague, usually they are taking the people outside the conflict to, to have fun. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, even, you know, to go outside of the stress. Uh, the idea was one of the speakers that we had was a, a previous or a former uh, uh, prime minister to one European country. And, and this European country is don donating something like 15 to $20 million uh, to, to, the, to the conflict. Not that, like, I don't know exactly where, but I, and, and in this talk, I was talking to this previous official and telling him why you don't stop giving this $20 million to the conflict because you are doing nothing. You are just wasting the money. And his, his answer was very interesting to me. He said, until, you know that, until we invested this $20 million in this conflict, we rarely had the opportunity to meet with senior American officials and we rarely been invited to visit the White House. But since we put this much of money, which is a very small amount of money, we are invited very often to visit the White House. We are, we are having a chair on the, on the table of donors. We are respected and we are having like more and more connections with the Americans and with many other uh, around the world. This proved that unfortunately there's, that there's a, a, what's happening in, in, in this conflict was and continued to be is a conflict management rather than conflict resolution. Only what is happening that the world and the donor community is putting money in different projects, in different initiatives, knowing from the beginning that will never end the, 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 the conflict. But they keep doing this. Why? Because they have their own interest. Unfortunately, they have their own interest and they want to keep this interest and they don't really, not only don't care, I believe they want this con conflict to continue some. So from here, I will, I will, I will say that maybe through all of the initiatives that I was through. Unfortunately, until today, nothing really changed between the, in the society, the both societies. There's very few people participating in, in, in these dialogues, in these meetings, and these peace, like track two, as they call them, track two meetings. The same people, almost you will find them here and there. The same initiatives you'll see, see X, Y, and Z, and after, Two years you will see X, Y, and Z also there, both sides. And, and, and what is more interesting that what's happening in, inside these rooms or privately is directly changed when you are going publicly. I, I'm, I'm not, not different myself. Like I'm doing a lot of interviews, media interviews, and, and unfortunately, 
when you go publicly, you go with your own narrative, your people narratives. You never go with what was happening in, in, inside closed rooms. You tell the people one-on-one, -on -one, you tell them something, and when you go publicly and we go to your own people, you tell them something totally else. I think here we should, all the peacemakers should really tackle, I'm not telling, I'm not claiming to be an expert in this field or like really having a, 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 a say here, but what I'm saying that there's a big problem, there's a waste of money, and there's even not only a waste of money, there's a, a money that's being put here and it's inflaming the conflict in a different way. It's not that only Iran is supporting one side and, 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 and making it fresh. Also, the peace business is, is, uh, are, are, are making a lot of people also rich by not achieving peace. Uh, uh, so this is uh, my, the, my, my only message that I, I want to like send here is, let's stop the conflict management and move to conflict resolution. Let's stop uh, uh, like, talking to on the sides and, and privately and we go publicly where we're the same on the same narratives. Uh, hopefully I was fast enough. And, yes, and, yes and that was great. Yeah. Thank and, you. That, that very challenging. And we were we were hoping uh, that we would that this conversation would produce some self-reflection on the part of the peace the peace building community and your this helps. So uh, let me get now to our final speaker, our cleanup hitter, as I told him. Uh, I, my, my colleague, uh, Daniel Rothbard. Uh, professor Rothbard uh, has been at the Carter School now as a full professor for an, a number of years. Uh, he's an author and conflict resolution practitioner. Um, he specializes in prevention of mass violence, ethnic conflicts, Power and Conflict, The Ethics of Conflict Resolution. He's particularly interested in the civilians in war and the psychopolitics of conflict. He is the co-director of our program on prevention of mass violence and also is the director of a, a peace lab that we that entitled Transforming the Mind uh, for Peace. He's written all kinds of uh, articles and books. Um, most recently, a book on systemic humiliation, uh, fighting for dignity within systems of degradation. And so, Dan, uh, we're very happy that you're here to uh, to complete our presentations. So, it's yours. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Rich, for organizing this. And um, okay, um, so one aspect of this terrible conflict that we're very familiar with is that there's many ways in which civilians are being killed. Civilians are being bombed through missiles, through drones. They're being shot at close range, we all know. Uh, hand grenades, different forms of killing, they're being crushed by the buildings that have been bombed. And then of course, there's the tragedy of fatal deprivation of essential resources. Um, this is of course, uh, a, an element of the tragedy here. Obviously, it's not rare. That kind of killing is not rare in other large-scale conflicts. But there's, um, and it's, and I'm talking about both sides. But there's something underlying this that is a major force of these methods of killing. And that what's underlying this is 
an anti-civilian ideology. Now, of course, neither side will say this, neither side will broadcast this because both sides claim moral justification, obviously, but it's a deeply embedded way of thinking that is pervasive in modern warfare, where the may, a major strategy of the militants is to um, attack civilians. It's a driving force that underpins the military strategy. It's a driving force that that military science, of course, doesn't broadcast, doesn't find, you know, prominent in their textbooks, but it underpins the much of the militaries. So what is this ideology? Well, I want to just say very briefly, there are three defining elements of this anti-civilian ideology that is prevalent in this war and, in, and of course in other wars. First, the militants are determining war's reality. That is, the reality of war is determined by the militants on both sides. That's the real aspect of war. And what happens to civilians is minor, is consequential of the driving forces of militarism. The mostly men and machines basically control civilians. Civilians can be pushed, removed, displaced, deprived, and of course, in some cases, killed. Now, this notion of reality represents a flagrant distortion of what happens in protracted violent conflicts. And what happens is that civilians in most cases of protracted violent conflict represents the highest, the higher rate of casualties than militants. The ratio is varies. Sometimes it's two to one, that is two to one fatalities to militants. Sometimes it's eight to one. But in almost every case, every case that I know of, uh, and we've done extensive research on civilians in war globally, in every case in the past, say, uh, certainly since World War II, civilians represent the highest rate of casualty. I just mentioned here at the bottom of the screen, in Iraq, 151 violent related Iraqi deaths were civilians. Um, and we heard this by, by a couple of our speakers. Um, now, in the case of is Israel and Gaza, we've all seen the statistics as of November 22nd, 1,237 Israeli civilians have been killed, um, and over 14,000 Palestinians, most of them, you know, of course, we can debate about the, the authenticity of the data source, but don't minimize the main point. Civilians represent a larger casualty. And according to the, the data, two, about two thirds of them are women and children. That is two thirds, excuse me, two thirds of the Palestinians killed in Gaza are, are women and children, about 70%. This is uh, according to the United Nations. And here's just some charts. I won't have time to go through this in detail, just the, 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 the time for this the, and so on, the timeline of the fatalities. Um, and this represents a long, tr long tradition over years of civilian fatalities. This is a, a routine and I think a uh, tragically defining aspect of this prolonged conflict and, and other conflicts. A second element of this ideology is that civilians are cast as expendable. They can be, they can be 
denied. And there's three kinds of narratives for expendability. First, maybe some in some wars, civilians are evil. Second, civilians might be legitimate targets. And third, civilians are collateral. These are three possible narratives. In the case of this war, both sides exhibit an ideology that casts civilians as legitimate targets, reflecting a ruthless pragmatism. Now, the evidence of this, I think, is very clear that um, when Defense Minister Gal Galant ordered a complete siege of the Gaza Strip, obviously, this is a not only a violation of international humanitarian law, but also uh, a form of, 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 of pragmatism, of violent pragmatism. And many cases, many uh, testimony and remarks by Israeli official officials basically denigrate Palestinians, as uh, Professor Abu Nimer correctly pointed out. I have just lists here, I won't have time to go through them. On the Palestinian side, I see no moral uplift for the kidnapping of the hostages, even many of whom these uh, faces are hostages that remain. Um, there's, uh, and this is also reflects obviously a strategy of civilian devastation. Um, a third aspect of this anti-civilian ideology is moral competition. This is routine where both sides are competing for their moral purity. Our cause is just, theirs is not, we had no choice, their violations are worse than ours, our casualties are higher, and so on. And especially the, the one I have here listed on the bottom, we are morally pure, they are degenerate. This is a common narrative of the um, Israeli Defense Force. Um, and of course, it, it is not rare, that type of narrative is not rare in war, um, which reflects basically a conflation of two important doctrines in international humanitarian law. That is, we should not conflate the rationale for war with the conditions for regulating the conduct of militants. This is an important distinction in international humanitarian law um, establishes requirements for both the conditions for states that are permitted to use armed force and the conditions for regulating the conduct of militants. What happens routinely in this and many other wars is say that we are justified basically in violating um, the international humanitarian law in terms of the conduct of, of, of uh, their militants. This is now obviously routine. So just the final point here is that we must basically, under as, as peace builders, we must actively engage in a campaign to establish a civilian-centered perspective, even to the, the evils of war. That means recognize the plight of civilians as central, also recognize civilians are vulnerable, not expendable, and promote moral equality and not moral competition. And I will end it there. Uh, Dan, that was very interesting and it was done exactly on time. So what we're, uh, okay. we're well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, friends, uh, we uh, have some time now for questions and comments and we will, um, we're supposed to close this at 4.30, but we will stick around for another 10 or 15 minutes uh, in order to give people a chance to participate if they want to. So if you raise your hands, we'll recognize you. Uh, Osama, I see your hand. Um, hey, thank you, Rich, and hello, everybody. Go right um, ahead. What's, what's better than uh, this face to lighten up the, the discussion a little bit. So uh, I chose to, can you guys see us here? Okay. So I, cho I chose to uh, join here with Lila um, and, and just quickly 
throw a couple of things. First, thank you for this session. I think it's well needed, and it's uh, it's uh, truly, truly important for for us peace uh, makers and builders and practitioners in order to draw strength from each other. The one question that I have, and I and I really would love to to get your take on it. Um, Adina mentioned something about ignoring the Palestinian issue and moving forward. I think some of us, a lot of us had some debate over whether we should or not um, jump over the wagon of cheering the Abraham Accords while we know that it's not genuine and it's motivated by political reasons and it's, it's got its own agenda. However, uh, for us Palestinians who were saying, who called bullshit on these agreements, we were accused as peacemak peacemakers that we're not genuine and that we should have supported these peace deals. This is one of the questions. And the second one is when, we're, when we are suffocating all nonviolent uh, forms of resistance, such as BDS, we're always accused of being not genuine peacemakers and that we are not actually devoted for peace. And since we all know that this conflict really, at the end of the day, evolves around the, the, the theme of equity, is her life equal to a, to a Jewish life or not? It, 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 why, is, why are we making things too complicated and not calling on uh, a joint goal addressing the, the root cause of the problem and calling for end of occupation? and not criminalizing nonviolent resistance as peacemakers from both sides. Um, I'll, I'll pause here and, and thank you. I'll, I'll leave room for All others. Right. Osama, thanks for that. I'm going to um, would, uh, ask the speakers to keep that, make a note of that question, keep it in mind. And we'll take a couple more questions so that we make sure we get people you know, in who, who want to get in and then we'll answer a couple of questions. All right. So. Uh, Alex Brodsky, you have a hand up. Yeah, thank you. So nice uh, to hear a very thoughtful discussion. So talking about the next uh, steps or how to get out of there, uh, uh, Muhammad in the beginning made very good points, right? Stop dehumanizing the state human dignity, uh, human equality, and these, of course, are wonderful and, and uh, important principles. On a practical level, however, I think it's clear to everyone that there is no way to continue with any kind of peaceful resolution if Hamas, which is uh, a brutal terrorist organization, deliberately killing civilians, stays in power, which is kind of Islamic militant regime uh, terrorizing Palestinians as well. So I was wondering what the, the, the people in this audience think, whether there's any chance of any peaceful process uh, if Hamas stays in power in Gaza. Uh, I also would like to make a comment regarding the last presentation of uh, Daniel, who mentioned that major strategy is to attack civilians on both sides. And I absolutely agree with you that Hamas, as a brutal terrorist organization, right, uh, uh, killing families, burning them alive, raping women, of course, they attack civilians. However, when you apply this to IDF, that's completely wrong. Okay, and I'm telling you, as a former IDF officer, it's against the principles of purity of arms in IDF. It's contrary to the Israeli law. It's contrary, uh, it's contrary to the facts. And uh, beyond that, of course, it's not in the interest of Israel, just pure interest to, to increase the number of civilian uh, death. So I, I completely disagree with you on that point, okay? Uh, it's, a, it's tragedy, it's, it's, it's a heartbreaking tra tra tragedy of uh, innocent civilians in Israel and in Gaza dying. That's, that's a, that's a tragedy, tra tragedy no, no doubt. But your characterization with respect to IDF is completely wrong. 
I will take it off. All right, thank you, Mr. Brodsky, appreciate that. Um, so make a note of that, please, speakers who want to speak to that. Are, are there any, let's take one more question and then we will answer a couple of them. Mary Jo, nice to see you here. <laughs> thank you. I, I, I would like to uh, pick up on that question of, of um, labeling and terrorism as a label that is applied differently to governing uh, institutions that are formally recognized by the UN versus governing institutions that are perhaps dealing with a certain nation. Uh, I, I did some work in the West Bank and I was stunned to learn that we could not work on environmental issues with NGOs that had anyone and including environmentalists who was paid by uh, Hamas, which was a, the governing uh, organization in Gaza. And so this labeling of the entire um, uh, governing body as terrorist is, it's, it's a serious problem. It's not just here in, in the situation between Israel and, and um, well, let's just say the Palestinians, but it's the, the, the labeling and the categorization and the definitions create this inability to move forward. And so I just wanna bring that up as a, a real serious challenge. It's a linguistic challenge, but it's also a psychological challenge. Thanks. Mary Jo, thanks very much. Uh, there are a couple more hands up, but let's take these questions first and let's have the answers be fairly brief too, if you don't mind. Uh, it, 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 would anybody like to, to take the, the question from Osama uh, about the, the, the genuineness of, the, of peace deals and so forth? Anybody have a comment on that? I have a comment in both of them as well. Go right ahead, Mohammed. Yeah, um, you know, I don't think the peace deals are genuine in the sense of engaging Palestinians and the uh, Israelis in a, in a sustainable peace agreements. I think they were done for a business and for in, in many ways, you know, different economic interests as well. And also to uh, uh, precisely from the Israeli side to bypass the Palestinian issue. The primary objective of the Abrahamic Accord is to create a bypass along around the Palestinian issue and allow Israel to continue and occupied the territory of 1967 and remotely controlled Gaza from outside. And, and I think you know that's why this is the major critique of it. The BDS is obviously should be very effective. You saw Osama, it's been fought you know, very hard as well. And the BDS is what ha helped, I think, uh, South Africa, uh, um, uh, the apart, you know, uh, uh, attacking or, or delegitimizing the apartheid, I think, it has a great potential in the Palestinian Israeli context as well. And that should be, I think it should be, um, be more, more, um, taking more, you know, uh, comprehensively and seriously in it. And uh, the Abrahamic, again, the Abrahamic Accord are not necessarily, um, you know, responsive to that or, or re relating to it with a great deal of. Uh, suspicion about it. Um, just very briefly on the second point, Mr. IDF, former IDF uh, soldier, uh, Alex. I, I don't know if you were IDF soldier for so many years, I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, you still did not see uh, the IDF engage in any ter state terrorism attack in, in Gaza, in the West Bank, leave Gaza on the side. Hamas is terrorist, but what has Israel and the IDF done in the West Bank in the past 52 days? This morning, just a sniper killed two Palestinian kids walking, and it was filmed by by so many, you know, there's so many evidence. And I'm really sorry that you still in the mind that the IDF is running a morally humane, ethically uh, motivated operation. That's something really worrying me. Uh, to listen to it from somebody who's in the in the business of field and conflict resolution uh, in in many ways, and Israeli government is not very different from Hamas. Israeli government with Benny Gvir and the Smutrich <laughs> did not recognize the Palestinian right to exist. No state. They want to expel them out of the land as well. And these guys have access to nuclear weapon. 
this ideology of the current Israeli government has so much um, risk and the threat, not only to Palestinian. I really feel for the Israeli Jewish citizen of Israel and Jews around the world that this leadership is taking control of the cabinet of Israel. And I don't see them very different from, from the ideology of Hamas religiously, as well as in terms of militancy. The difference between them, one is a state and the other one is a militant group in many ways. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that, but you know, again, look, look very closely at these practices of the, this current government. This, given, this is the current government that prohibited 1.7 million Palestinians like, like Fakhira, if you listen to her discourse, from, from making a one like on Facebook. She could end up in a prison. That, that, that's the ethical and the morality of the Israeli security has been. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have a, a short a short comment if if I'm allowed. All right, uh, okay, Moyen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for for the peace initiatives, I think we it's it's like we are always putting the the cart like in front of the horse and oh, back the horse. Sorry, because like we never at the, like before talking about peace initiatives, we should allow the Palestinians to elect freely their own leadership. And from there, this leadership, legitimate leadership supported by the Palestinian street can go and make these deals. But keep talking about peace initiatives and peace agreements with whom? Like who, will, who has the legitimacy in the Palestinian street to do any kind of, 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 of agreement? Yeah. This is, uh, yeah, I'd like to make I'd like to make a comment on that uh, myself, um, and that is um, it's a difficult, certainly a difficult question when you're talking about Hamas. Which, among other reasons, we don't know very much uh, how Hamas is organized. Uh, who knew Who knew what about the attack of October seventh? Who Who was in charge and so forth? The leadership is in is in uh, Bahrain or, or Doha, wherever the hell they were. Um, so, I mean, there are some unknowns there, but we know two things, I think. I think we know that there are people who uh, committed a, a, atrocities against civilians who, who were, for, for which uh, Hamas is responsible. We also know, as it's been pointed out, that Hamas has been the governing authority in Gaza for since since 2006, um, and despite attempts to overthrow it by Israel and by the Palestine by, by the Palestine organ the, by the Palestinian Authority. Um, and when the so that when I mean this this is a this is a with reference to what Mr. Brodsky said. When you call the whole organization hopelessly terrorist, um, it's certainly true that they've done terrorist things, um, and of course, so did the so did the National Liberation Front in Vietnam. They were terrorists. Terrorism was an essential part of NLF, the the Viet Cong procedure. So were the Front Nost, Front Liber the FLN. In Algeria, they were notorious terrorists. If you look at the Battle of Algiers, the movie, you'll see that in, in the dramatized. Um, very often, resistance organizations of various kinds have been, or, or call them what you like, to, to use another word than the resistance, if you like, uh, insurre insurrectionist organizations um, are, are terrorists. and then people always say we will never negotiate with them. How can you negotiate with people who want to destroy you, who are nothing but terrorists? But then it turns out that there are people in that organization who want something other than just to destroy you. And some of them turn out to be negotiators. So that the United States makes peace with the Viet Cong and with the North Vietnamese. The French, through de Gaulle, make peace with the Algerians, and there's a long list. In fact, there's a whole library on negotiating with terrorists. So some of our colleagues have produced the books. You very often end up negotiating with 
at least sectors of organizations that have formerly been considered terrorists. So to kind of to follow up what Moyen just said, it would seem to me that if there are going to be negotiations, they are going to involve, they'll have to involve some elements uh, of uh, Hamas. Um, and uh, I, I know it sounds, a lot of people will get really upset if I ever, if I say that, but I've been saying it lately because I think it's true. They would also involve some elements of the Palestine Authority, very likely. Um, but the, how, the idea that if you read, for example, Thomas Friedman's article in the New York Times this morning about how the Palestine Authority is the key to the is to the key to a peace process. And if you don't realize that how discredited they are, how corrupt and discredited that the, the Palestine Authority are, if you don't realize the kind of heroic status that um, Hamas has achieved in the minds of many people, not only in Gaza, but on the West Bank, um, then, there, then you're basically, you're making negotiation impossible. If there's gonna be negotiation, as it's been said many times, it has to be with your enemy. So then the question becomes, how many more God, residents of God that do you want to kill before you make up your mind to negotiate with the, somebody that you're going to have to negotiate with? Um, a, a very hard problem, and that's that's all I'm. That's all I wanted to say about it. Um, so we have. I have two hands from speakers and I have one, I have one hand from, an, let me get another person, another participant in and then call on Fakhra and Daniel. But Teresa, let's hear from you first. Okay, thanks for, for letting me ask my question. So I'm a community member and I'm, you know, um, experiencing the conflict as a community member with, I have a Palestinian partner and I have Jewish American friends um, so what I want to know is in the context of the United States, how does the peace building community suggest people in this country orient our minds toward the conflict and how it impacts our relationships and communities? So acknowledging that many different communities feel vulnerable, um, I wonder what sorts of dialogues we can encourage between individuals and then also within our own communities that can help push this conversation forward. I'm particularly concerned with the idea of being anti-Zionist being, means being anti-Semitic. And so um, I'm really interested to hear from the wonderful panelists on how we can deal with that it, here. Okay, I, I have to say that I've just written an article for Counterpunch Magazine about that on that very issue. And if you're interested, take a look at Counterpunch and and I'm discussing anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism there. Uh, Fakhra, what do you have to say? Yeah, I, I just want to say that maybe it's, I'm not answering the question, but I want to say that some Palestinians and also Israelis with all the pain of the, the escalation and the violence going on, some of them feel that these events brought back the Palestinian-Israeli conflict to the agenda and to the global agenda. And I think I want to warn the international community not to fall into the discourse again, also this discourse about Hamas as a terror, and also to agree somehow not to tackle the root causes of this conflict and the occupation and the ongoing uh, uh, oppression uh, on the Palestinians, which mean Palestinians are not willing to return back to the status quo of uh, October 6th. And we need, a, because of the new level of violence that's going on in the conflict, we need a new level of courageous voices also by the international community that is demanding also a addressing the conflict and also give promises to the people because people need a, a hope. Otherwise, we are not going out of this circle. So we need the voices of the international community and the intervention of the international community and the, the courageous voices of the international community, I can say. And uh, uh, so that's it. And not to fall in the previous discourse about the conflict. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Dan. Uh, do you want to pick Rich, uh, a participant, I see hands up. 
or not. Well, go ahead. You're, you have, okay. you're, you're right very, up. very quickly, I, I greatly appreciate Mr. Brodsky's um, question and, and recognize his, his objection. And um, I, I, I just want to say basically almost every country in war basically wants to maintain a position of of, of moral, um, as it were, legitimacy, to put it mildly. And on the other hand, what we have in, the, in many cases is a history of uh, Israeli officials who are basically openly declaring that the civilians are targets. And I will, I, you know, I can cite this, I can put this in the chat, um, just a couple of comments. Um, which I'll do right now. Um, okay. And uh, anyway, so there's a long history of this, but I, I greatly appreciate your your observation. Thank you, Dan. Adina. Okay, so I wasn't an officer in the IDF, but I was in the in the army many moons ago. Um, so I was doing an exercise with my daughter, who is my daughter, so she's half American Israeli and half Muslim and facing a lot of challenges in school in different ways. And I showed her pictures of the soldiers killed in this in this uh, conflict since the seventh, um, posing with their rifles and their uniform and smiling. And I told her, look, for Israelis looking at this, of course, it's our sons, our brothers, our, we know we we have a rounded picture of the person so we don't look at it unidimensional. If the Palestinians look at this, they see in these pictures exactly what most Israelis see when they see a picture of a Palestinian militant with a weapon, et cetera. So this, again, this, um, anyway, just that's just a side note. But Osama, whom I'm glad is, glad is here, we talked, I think we mentioned before, Fakhara mentioned the importance of relationships and grounding and making sure people haven't changed. changed. So, Fahara is my friend for many years. Osama is my close friend for uh, over 25 years. We were in projects together in, in Israel, Palestine, and um, remained close friends. And he's so one of the workshops, one of the first workshops that he and I ran together years ago in this area, there was one Israeli guy who had also served as an officer in the army, very nice guy. And every time there were Every time Palestinians would tell him about stories from the checkpoints, this guy would say, who I'm still in touch with, very nice guy, would say, you know, that can't be because I was in the office, I was in the army, I never did such things to the Palestinians, and none of the people I know did it. And it continued like that till every Palestinian pretty much in that workshop told him similar, told similar stories of those experiences. So that this guy, by the reflection at the end of the weekend, had to say, you know, I couldn't see myself like that. But if every single Palestinian is telling me this kind of a narrative without coordinating, their experience must also be true. And so let me re-examine what I know about what is done in my name by this military. So that's just a really basic thing about us, you know, not wanting to recognize what is done often in our name or um yeah um but so okay. again even if yeah so the military still ha does all these things that a lot of israelis don't recognize but one second point just with zionism i think back to my point before about consistency and uh, so demonizing for, for israeli jews for most of them Zionism is equivalent to the purest form of patriotism. I'm not talking about ex only extremist, racist, da, 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 in Israel who exist. It's the, the best form of patriotism. Now, you can disagree with that, but if that is not also understood, then, there's n then tackling it with Israelis will be, and with other Jews, will not, will not reach them because that's not, it, it doesn't mean to them what it means to their critics. Just like Palestinian nationalism is many different things, not just its most virulent, violent expressions. So just to look at it, I'm not justifying or not uh, any ideologies, just saying 
to look at their complexity and what they mean to the people who are, who are advocating them, to all the okay. people, not just the Good. extremists. Thank you, Adina. Thank you, Alex. Everybody is um, talking about you or to you. If you want to, if you want an answer, if you want to reply to any of this, we're happy to hear that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, sure, sure. But I thank you for the for the thoughtful uh, comments, um, and I I respectfully disagree with you. I agree but, but with Mohammed with you on many uh, comments you've made. Uh, but calling Israel the same as Hamas is absolutely uh, is absolutely wrong. Um, not, now, not, not Israel. The Israeli government with Ben Gvir. With Ben Gvir, I, I disagree with uh, with Gvir on many points. I certainly wouldn't uh, vote for him. Uh, but Ben Gvir is 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 a constellation. Uh, now, uh, Rich, Dr. Rubinstein, to to your point that you negotiate with terrorists, of course. Israel now negotiates indirectly with Hamas for release of hostages. Right. That doesn't, of course, and so your points are absolutely correct. It doesn't change the fact that Hamas is a brutal terrorist organization. And uh, 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 PLO, of course, also was a terrorist organization uh, until Oslo when they recognized the existence of Israel. Now, in practical terms, there won't be negotiation in Hamas and they will not stay in power in Gaza which will prevent any progress whatsoever. Uh, Hamas will be destroyed. And unfortunately, uh, uh, if, if they surrendered today, the conflict would be over with much less casualties. But Hamas will be gone. Hamas will be gone at just the practicality of the situation today. Uh, uh, just wanted to make this point clear. I agree with your points. It doesn't change the fact that they're a brutal terrorist organization. Uh, and. Everyone understands that, Biden's administration understands that, of course, Israelis understand that, Sunni states understand that, Egyptians understand, understand that there is no way forward with Hamas present. So however painful, Hamas will be dismantled in Gaza. That's the reality of it. And I hope that it will happen with minimizing tragic civilian casualties, which is heartbreaking. Well, I agree with you on that. Um, yes, well, that, that's those, those are interesting comments, and we could go on back and forth uh, with, with each other. But we have Megan with a hand raised. So, Megan, we've, you've waited long enough. What do you have to say? Uh, thank you, and thank you, everyone, um, speaking and leading this conversation. I think it's really important. Um, in regards to the comment about uh, you know why this small piece of land um, is so discussed on a global scale um, with, with the passion that it is. Um, we, we talked about that a little, and I'm just wondering your thoughts on the fact that it is the only country with a Jewish majority. And, and I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Uh, For instance, does that yes. have anything to do with it? Well, well, um, with, I'm, I'm not sure what the question, what you're in question, what you, what are you implying, and what, what do you speak more directly? What's your, what's your theory? Well, I, I don't know how we can have a conversation about, you know, why it is so publicized, again talked about on this scale, um, without mentioning the fact that it is. The only country with a Jewish majority, and I'm I'm wondering your thoughts. Well, it is it, it, it's it is the only country that I know of with a Jewish majority, and um, as we all know, um, the reason for that has to do with um, activities and uh, with the with the Second World War and with post-war activities, the, uh, which led to the partition of Palestine by the UN. Um, so you, you know, you could say it's the only state with a Jewish majority. Uh, you could also say it's the only Arab state of which part, part of which the, the majority of land was given uh, to another people, to an, you know, to a non-Arab people. Uh, so it, it's an unusual place, both because it has a Jewish majority and because it, it 
because some almost a million people got displaced uh, for that in order for the, that state to be created. Um, so, so it's it's uh, right. So, so. Um, uh, oh well, I'm, I'll stop there. I have I see Mohammed's hand up. Go ahead, Mohammed. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to offer a, a, a until I found the. the I lower my hand, you recognize me. Um, I think uh, I think Rich, uh, this is a very good question because it relates to the status of exceptionalism that the uh, European and American foreign policy have yeah. granted Israel since 1948 and the few years before that. And this uh, exceptionalism allowed Israel not to be held accountable for many of the policies exercised in the occupied West Bank and also prior to that between 48 and 66 when they placed the Palestinian minority under military administration. This exceptionalism come as you pointed the rich because of the uh, uh, guilt feeling of the Holocaust and the responsibility that the, the European and American felt in order to uh, provide the protection for the uh, Jews who survived the Holocaust and historic Palestine was presented as the solution for that in, 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 in sync with the Zionist movement in late 1800, early 1900. And that exceptionalism continued to be, in, but in today, I want to reflect because I really admired Fakhira and uh, Adina's sense of reflection on this. And I want to say that I have struggled again and again with the value of Palestinian human life versus Israeli Jewish human life. And I find in it, in the core of it, is really a racist, in, in, in many ways, a racial uh, racism in it, because you struggle to prove to everybody that you are human and you have a human dignity, yet when there is one victim on the Jewish-Israeli border side, that get elevated internationally, globally. Uh, my daughter asked me, what, what do you think will happen if there were 13,000 Israeli Jews killed? And I could not answer because it, you know, <laughs> I couldn't even imagine that. And I think the, the 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 focus on Israel and on this conflict, Rich, you said something very, very, very powerful in the beginning. How many millions of people in Africa? You said nine hundred thousand people killed in one conflict, and we did not move as it. It did not get any public uh, public coverage. It, you know, so many conflicts took place. Yet we're obsessed with this in the U.S. and Europe. Again, due to the pro-Israel lobby. A, a, a power and influence over our politicians, our national uh, national foreign policy. And as a result, any injury, anything that get damaged in Israel, Palestine, we mobilized internationally in order to uh, make sure it doesn't happen again and to protect all, all, all civilian, particularly the Israeli Jewish civilian. And that in itself, what I was referring to in terms of humanity, in terms of the sense of equal life, giving attention to all people who are losing their life in this conflict. And that's where the US foreign policy have lost the global South, lost the, the most of the people in the Arab region and the Muslim, European and American foreign policy have really, really bankrupted themselves in their reaction during this conflict. And I think, unfortunately, that's part of why so much attention is given to the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's not about the Palestinian lives. It's about the protection of the Israeli-Jewish uh, project in the region and using Holy Land terminology, using all these other terminology to provide justification for it. And that's unfortunate, and that's in it. If I was living in Africa, if I was living in South Asia, if I was living in, in Central Asia, I would be really very, 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 you know, very, uh, very, very. Okay. I'll stop Thank there. You. There's no, no words. No words. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm not sure I would 
call it racist or maybe orientalist, but but I think really nationalism under pressure becomes racist. And it's, you know, whether it's, uh, whatever the nationality is, I don't think anybody, I don't think, I think the, op, you know, the, the opposite uh, of this kind of racism isn't, is, is, is kind of, is not, it's not nice nationalism, it's internationalism. And how we get, how we get back to an internationalist consciousness is a major question for us, for our field and, uh, and for our, you know, our species. I think, how do we get to species consciousness? Because, that, I mean, that's the antidote. That's the antidote to this kind of racism, it seems to me. But anyway. Can I respond uh, to we, that? Uh, we have, um, we have got to, we absolutely have to stop before five. So we have four, I see four hands up, uh, which means you have about two minutes each, okay? So uh, I will go in order, uh, in the order that I see them. Medina first, then Abby, then Osama, then Alex. Okay, go so ahead. the way, the way I understood the comment by Megan was that she meant that she was asking whether Israel is more heavily scrutinized because it's being Jew because it is Jewish. I think there's a combination of of both things because I think uh, different forms of racism are not mutually exclusive. So anti-Semitism is a real sentiment and it's I'm not equating it with anti-Israelism. I'm equating it with anti with anti-Semitism. It really does exist in the US and in other places in the world. And that could be part of the scrutiny. But on the flip side of that scrutiny, um, I think is also um, a little bit of what Mohammed mentioned that I don't think it's the Israel lobby, like it's not the Jews convincing the Americans to be on their side because the Jews are just so powerful and, you know, all all able. But it's because certain messages about the project named Israel resonate with certain uh, constituents in the U.S. Personally, I don't agree with a lot of those messages. And personally, for me, that's unfortunate that those messages um, resonate with each other. But the American lobbies, including the Christian right, et cetera, and other maybe political lobbies, um, support a lot of things that Israel does because of their racism towards towards Arabs, which I, I think Mohammed might have alluded to that. But anyway, I think it's also the West's, quote unquote, or the Americans' um, sentiments towards Arabs as opposed they forget like there are people like Fakhara, you know, Christian Arabs, uh, watching over their holy sites in the Holy Land. But there's this prejudice that a lot of people have, uh, some against Jews, and therefore they scrutinize, and some against Arabs, Palestinians in, in particular, in this case, and they scrutinize comparing the, the Israelis to them or the Westerners like themselves, and the Palestinians aren't. So Megan, I think I understood your question. I think it, we can talk more later, but I think it has, um, I personally think it has both sides prejudice in two different directions. Thank you, Adina. Abby, please. Hi, Abby. thank you so much. Um, I am a community member. I was invited to this at the last minute and I'm not sure I really knew uh, what I was walking into or the context or what the purpose of the forum is, but um, and I don't have time to get into everything right now, and I know we need to end by five, but I'm an American Jew, and in answer to some of the concerns, you know, Megan, I think you were alluding to at the end, and um, the question from another woman about the difference between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, I just want to say that it, I have not heard on this call um, among this group of panelists anything repre representing what I would consider based on my experience as um, a very active member of the American Jewish community to be a mainstream American Jewish or Israeli perspective apart from some of Alex's comments. And so for those people who are looking to understand more deeply, what is anti-Semitism? How is it reflected in the media's coverage? How is it different or overlapping with anti-Zionism? Is it appropriate to compare the IDF to Hamas in the way that has been done in the course of this conversation? 
Um, to what extent is that anti-Semitic? I think those are all really important questions. And I think the mainstream American, Jewish, Israeli perspective on those questions has not been represented in this conversation. So I think people should seek alternative sources of information to the extent they were hoping to hear a more balanced perspective. Yes, thank you for that comment. And uh, it's too bad that, about that, that's, that misunderstanding. Uh, the kinds of, con con it may be that in other events that are done um, that the Dean mentioned before that there'll be more of, a, of that sort of discussion. Uh, but if this was not, uh, we don't intend to present a balanced view, point of view in a, in a forum like this, which, which produces a debate. Uh, we wanted to, what we intended to do and what we did do was to have a discussion among people uh, interested in peace and conflict resolution about a, a conflict that's, you know, that we've all found very difficult to deal with. We had no intention of, of, of representing all possible views on the subject and the, the, the and uh, so it's too, I'm sorry you were disappointed, but there are other places I'm sure where you can find that kind of debate or you can just open the newspaper any, more, any day and see the debate taking place in the, in the newspapers. Um, at any rate, uh, Alex, uh, you, 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 you want to have a last word here? Uh, thank you. Thank you. So it's interesting that I'm for a lot of sympathy for the narrative that Muhammad presents, uh, the Palestinian narrative about the strife for self-determination, for dignity, for equal rights, for the ability to live you know, and raise your children. I have a lot of sympathy for that. But against that, you know, the, the, if you look at the conflict in a broader context, as you try to, uh, to allude to, it's not a religious conflict, right? It's a conflict between two people over land and self-determination, as you could, you, many of you correctly mentioned. And you have two people with very deep historical connection to this land, right? Both Jews, they're not colonizers, they're indigenous, and Palestinians, of course, which are indigenous there as well. So you have a conflict in this. In the end, there's no way, as I think most people agree here, without some kind of a peaceful resolution and coexistence, that is clear. But taking it to the practical level, there were four cases in history from the Peel Commission in 36, when Jews accepted and Palestinians rejected, partition of Palestine by UN in 48, is Israel, young Israel accepted, Palestinians rejected, 2000, last days of pre uh, President Clinton administration, Yasser Arafat walked out, 2008. So the point is, you know, as in the recent interview with uh, uh, Farid Zakaria, he said, I have a lot of sympathy for the Palestinian people, but I have very little sympathy for their leadership, right? They said no to many opportunities to make it happen. In the end, you need to have two parties to agree. But I'm very sympathetic to the, to the narrative that you present. And I sympathize with the Palestinian people. And I hope that eventually there will be peace. Uh, how we'll get there is it's a big question. And thank you all for the thoughtful discussion and, and comments. All right, thank you too. And um, Osama, I'm sorry, but we're gonna be, we're out of time, I'm afraid. So I'm not gonna be able to get to your, um, to your comment. I just, I wanted to thank everybody for participating in this. I have some, there are some, comp, there are some chat questions that were asked directly to me. And I'd be happy to answer those questions if you email me. I can't do it right now, but email me at uh, rubenstein.richard at gmail. Rubenstein.richard at gmail. I'd be happy to answer those questions if I can. And, uh, Thank you all very much for being here. It was a large and and um, and lively and lively bunch of people, and I hope that uh, you got something out of this discussion. Uh, and I, we hope to see you again. <laughs>